That subject, the subject of the person and the dynamic work of the Holy Spirit. We have come to the most important subject of all, and that is the feeling of the Holy Spirit. We have studied yesterday about the person of the Holy Spirit himself, as a third member of the Trinity. But today or this hour, you have come to the heart of the entire study. When Solomon built a temple, a magnificent temple in Israel, there were five things that the Jewish scholars observed, five things. They observed five things that they, were, that they were in that first temple. The first thing was the ark with the mercy seat. The ark, which represents or a type or a shadow of our Lord Jesus Christ, a picture of Christ with the mercy seat. The second thing they observed in that temple was the fire of God. The fire of God. The fire of God that came down from heaven. Of course we know fire represents purification. It represents also judgment. And the third thing they observed in that temple was Shekinah. Shekinah glory. The Shekinah glory. Because when, most, when Solomon finished the temple, God's glory filled the whole temple to the point that they couldn't go in. Rather, Outside, they bow in worship. And the fourth thing they observed in that temple was Purim and Tumim. Purim and Tumim. These were elements for determining God's will. And then the final thing was the Holy Spirit present in that temple. Also, the scholars, they say that when the second temple was built, remember the first temple was destroyed? When the second temple was built or rebuilt, those things were not found there. Moreover, they also, those Jewish scholars also say that when the latter prophets, Haggai, all those latter prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, when they died, that the Holy Spirit was departed. When Malachi, the last prophet, ministered the word of God under the influence of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit went off. And for 400 years, for 400 years, God was silent. No contact with Israel. And no message was given to them. They were totally dried up in preparation for what was to come in preparation for the coming of our lord jesus christ in preparation for the birth of the church in preparation for a new transition a transition whereby god will take everything that he deposited in the old temple and transfer it to you shekinah glory the Holy Spirit. 
the symbol of the Tumin and Purim for guidance. Everything has been deposited in you right now as you are sitting down. With your head bow, let's pray. Holy God, we bow before your throne, trembling before you, recognizing that we are here on earth just because you have placed us here. We're not here by an accident. For no accident, there is no accident in your program. Your program was planned in eternity past, as Isaiah tells us, with perfect faithfulness. And so we have come here this morning in continuation of this word, this study. You have called each one of us here, my brother Bruce, my brother Roxanne, uh, brother Tayo, who is putting everything together, and everyone here, you have called us for a special task. And so here I stand humbly asking that you will open our eyes that our being you with you this morning will not be in vain. In Christ's name. Amen. We are studying, let me put it this way, the most important doctrine in all of scriptures. If you don't understand this doctrine, forget about other doctrines. If you have no concept of what we're about to study, and that's why, for one reason, this is the first time I sat down. I'm sure it's not, I can see this Holy Spirit working in all this program. My brother, Tayo and I, we were talking, how I just, we finished yesterday with no comparison, with note, with Bruce. He just came right along and put the application. We never, of course, we never compare our note before we teach. But this morning I was just sitting down and said, it's like, Moses, I know you have put this program time by time, minute by minute, calculated every minute. But this time, I don't want you to rush. Just the rush. Why? This is the most important subject. Not that what our brother Rosa profoundly put here wasn't good. Excellent. What Bruce put in the morning, excellent. But this is the key. If you don't understand the feeling of the Holy Spirit, you might as well close your Bible and change your flight and go home. Because this is the key both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And so we are going to bend and carefully, as I take us through this road of the feeling of the Holy Spirit, and a very important subject, very important subject, Like I said, we need to approach this topic with a sober mind, fear and trembling. Make no mistake, it is not a matter of extremism. The truth does not need a magnifying glass. Based on a careful examination of many doctrinal books, sermons, and practices in Christianity today, a serious student of God's word is left to be forced to conclude that, there, that no single doctrine in all the New Testament is misunderstood, miscommunicated, and misapplied than the theology of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You wonder, why is that? Turn on television, uh, Cooper, uh, Abraham Cooper, a, a, a great scholar and a writer of the old, in his book 100 years ago, he, he said that many people have ignored this teaching. That was 100 years ago. And even in our time, many people still have ignored the teaching of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. 
And when it comes to the feeling of the Holy Spirit, many don't even know what you're talking about. Take a survey if you would. Ask people, what is the feeling of the Holy Spirit? And see what answer you would get. Ask Bible teachers. I have traveled extensively. And you get, you see what answers you'll be receiving from them. Well, we know the reason why people don't pay attention to it or why it has been misunderstood or miscommunicated. The reason is simple. Knowing that the feeling of the Holy Spirit is the combustion fuel that powers God's plan, Satan attacks the doctrine viciously. He knows that that's your life. He knows that that's the pipeline of spiritual life. He knows that without that, you have nothing in the plan of God. He knows that. And so what he does is, if he detects that you are going to just murder the water and talk about the Holy Spirit and fly like a butterfly and make people think good people and make them feel so good so they don't understand what it means, then he'll let you alone. That's what I told you. He's been to our classes. Satan came here to this class before you came in. Do you know that? He came before you came in. He never misses any class. He's a good student. Satan comes in like an angel of the light. And he sits down quietly. So he, when I say yesterday, I wasn't joking. He has literally attended every class that I personally or my brother Bruce or, or even our brother, even though this is his first time of joining us, even the ones he taught in the past, Satan had attended every class. Listen carefully to what he taught. Satan knew or knows that you don't mend with the word of God. And so when you come in, or when you plan to come in, he knows that you are not going to compromise. Satan knows that I will not compromise with the word of God. No wonder why he attacked this conference like no other. Everything went wrong this weekend. He was just attacking it. Either he is trying to bring somebody down to distract me, my board member in the emergency, or my brother Bruce, his son, was in trouble for the first time in 10 years. I have been traveling with him for 10 years. He had never told me that there was a problem in at home until yesterday. Everything was just going wrong. Because he knows that <laughs> Moses, I wish I can get my hand on you and choke you. <laughs> <laughs> and then this conference will be over. We thank God that I am hidden in Christ and Christ is hidden in God. He couldn't reach me. And that's why we have gathered. He can only be a student. Say that wherever you are, just keep quiet. <laughs> <laughs> what is the feeling of the Holy Spirit? Let's start with definition. The feeling of the Holy Spirit is a means whereby the Holy Spirit armed with divine assets armed with divine assets not your assets it's divine feels and controls the command post of a believer's soul for the purpose of the execution of God's plan for the purpose of execution of God's plan. By command post, I mean the mind, intellect, and the will. The mind, intellect, and the will. Remember what God said to Zechariah 4.6? Not by might, not by power, not by you are greeting your fist and say, I'm going to run this race and finish it. 
I'm going to be a better person from today on. When I'm driving on a highway this morning, I'm just going to be a righteous person. When somebody comes into my front, I'm going to say, God bless you. <laughs> I'm going to just, when my boss says something not too good, I'm just going to say, may God keep blessing you. I'm going to be a good person today. Just... I will be. I can't. I can't lie. I can't sin. That's might. Remember, I say not by might, not by power. The person can cut for you in the first place. You say, I, I told myself I'm not going to be angry. Because again, well, you're going too close. <laughs> I'm going to very soon you lose your temper. The Bible says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. God is perfect. His work is perfect. We are imperfect. There is no way an imperfect man or woman can impress a perfect God. There is no way an imperfect man or an imperfect woman can do anything to impress a perfect God. Whatever an imperfect person does will reflect imperfection. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how many people, how much people praises you. But if you are an imperfect person, whatever you do will reflect imperfection. You can be an, a, 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 a professional, an excellent builder, and you build a house. Somebody will come and find a crooked corner. That's imperfection. It's only God when he's finished building a building, he can't find a wrinkle in that building because he's perfect. And so, as a, as a perfect God, he cannot accept anything less than perfection. God cannot accept anything that is not perfect. He does not accept 99.9% Perfection. It has to be 100. And who, is, who can produce 100? <laughs> who can produce 100%? Not you, not me. The best of us can get close to 90. But that's still, like my brother used rats. Brother Ross, I used rats. Small rats, big rats, little rats. They are all rats. <laughs> right? You can't see, I, I, I use a similar example in, in illustrating, illustrating the same thing. Assuming that a, a, prof, a teacher said, they, they, for you to go to the next class, the cutoff point is 80%. And he gave all of us a hard test. And you struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle my sister Debbie scored 40 because she is very smart. And uh, my brother Bruce scored 79. Smarter than Debbie. Not, not, uh, not in the real sense. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll settle the fight later on. <laughs> but he scored 79. And my brother Richard, he hasn't been coming to class, and he scored 19%. And, and, and he, he, my brother Bruce sees the idea and says, what did you score? 19%. <laughs> 19%. But the teacher says you must have 80 to go to the next class. <laughs> <laughs> next year, 19% is sitting down repeating the class. 79 is sitting down repeating the same class. <laughs> What's funny? He got 79. Hi, but he's not 8. 19, all in the same level. You will repeat the same class. 
In the same way, there is nothing we can do to impress a perfect God, and that is what is why it is necessary that whatever God wants done must be done by Him and through you. It must be done by Him in total through you, the undeserving one. You're just a vessel. Everything God does, He does through us. And that's why he pro he, if God wants every, anything done, as we'll see in a minute, if God wants anything done, He must produce everything that is necessary to do what He wanted to be done. You come to the table with nothing. You come empty. You come empty with nothing. God has to supply and provide everything that you, you, you need to get his job done. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. And so when, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, he comes with divine assets. God has deposited divine assets in the person of the Holy Spirit so that when he enters into your soul, he's ready to go with divine assets, not your assets. Anything you do with that divine assets is wood, hair, and stubble. And it will not pass the test of fire at the judgment seat of Christ, at the Bema seat. And so, before we go any further, let's take care of the first teaching regarding the filling of the Holy Spirit. People, I have heard so many people, I'm sure you have. Some Bible teachers teach that the filling of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. Where did they get this passage from? Quickly, Acts 2.4. It's amazing. It's amazing that everything we go in the Bible is there. But it, it depends on what you are looking for. You can find everything in the Bible and you can make it say whatever you want it to say. In Acts 2, 4, and they, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. And so when people read this passage, the conclusion is that feeling of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. And if you ask in the quote to Acts 2, 14, 2 verse 4, that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began speaking in tongues. How can you dispute the scripture? It's there. But the problem is that scripture balances scripture. Scripture balances scripture. Scripture is compared with scripture. You don't build one particular doctrine on a particular passage in detrimental to other passages. They must be in harmony. The mistake that many people make is that they just take one passage and they build an empire of doctrine and they ignore other passages. Well, we must reject the teaching, this teaching or this assumption based on the other evidence of Scripture. One, feeling of the Holy Spirit occurred in the Old Testament. It is not only in the New Testament that we have the concept of the feeling of the Holy Spirit. It began in the Old Testament. And so, we will do well to examine some of these passages, Exodus 31. When God called Moses, he also called helpers. In Exodus, Exodus 31 verses 1 through 3, now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, See, I have called by name Bezediah, the son of Uri, the son of Hor, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all kinds of craftsmanship. I have filled him with the Holy Spirit, 
which will produce in him wisdom, which will give him an excellent understanding, which will give him divine knowledge, and which will equip him in every craftsman, craft, craft workmanship. And what is God saying here is that I, I am taking an ordinary man. I'm going to turn him into an extraordinary man. Not because he, he is equipped in himself, because the Holy, my Holy Spirit will do this work that I want to be done. I need a work of perfection, and the Holy Spirit will produce it through him. And, and you see in this passage, pay attention in all these passages, there was not a single speaking in tongues when he filled him with Holy Spirit. Bezalia did not speak in tongues in this passage. Because that was not the purpose of feeding of the Holy Spirit. It's to produce the work of God. God filled Joshua with the Holy Spirit as a leader in Deuteronomy 34. Deuteronomy 34 verse 9. Joshua was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now Joshua the son of Nun was filled with the Spirit, with the Holy Spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands on him, and the sons of Israel listened to him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. Most Joshua will now lead Israel. Big task. And God said, you can do it alone. You can do it by yourself. You need my power. Not by might, but by my spirit. So he filled him with the Holy Spirit of wisdom. So that the same wisdom that was produced in Bezalia, but here there was no speaking in tongues. Micah was filled with the Holy Spirit in Micah chapter 3 verse 8. Israel was in the state of, of, of apostasy, killing prophets in most cases. And God told Micah to go and give Israel, go and tell Israel, give them a message. And Micah said, you know these people, how can that be? Well, God said, don't worry, I'll get it done. He filled him with the Holy Spirit. Look at Micah 3, 8. Micah 3, 8. On the other hand, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and courage to make known to Jacob his rebellion act, rebellious act, even to Israel his sin. See what is in that verse. Filled with the Holy Spirit, which produces power, courage, and that courage is synonymous to boldness. So that Micah can stand before Israel and tell them, Thus says the Lord, you are a rebellious people. It wasn't Micah saying to them, but the Holy Spirit was empowering him to speak, the same way he did with Peter. That is the work of the feeling of the Holy Spirit. Here, there was no speaking in tongue involved. And that was just a few of the feeling of the Holy Spirit that are called in the Old Testament. There were many more of this. But because of our time, the second feeling of the Holy Spirit occurred in pre-Pentecost era. In pre-Pentecost era, in other words, in the New Testament, before the Pentecost time, Feeling of the Holy Spirit also occurred. Look at Luke one fifteen. Luke one fifteen. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. While he ate in his mother's womb, literally even from his mother's womb, 
in the literal sense. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit away from his mother's womb. Speaking of John the Baptist, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit at birth. But in the, all the ministry of John the Baptist, there was no record anywhere that he spoke in tongues. He simply spoke with boldness, calling the Israelites not to hate, not so quiet. But it's something closer. You vipers, that's what he called them. You vipers, who warned you to come here? Would you imagine Moses be having a, a, a crusade? And people gathered on the crusade and I stand and say, You vipers, what are you doing here? <laughs> I'm sure my team will say, Moses, well, cut, cut this. <laughs> you, got, you got too far. <laughs> well, that was John the Baptist. He looked straight in their eyes and called them vipers. That was nice. That wasn't nice. Was it nice? <laughs> but that was the power of the Holy Spirit, the boldness. But he never once spoke in tongues. Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit in Zechariah chapter 167. The result was not filling of the was not speaking in tongues, but speaking the word of God. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit in Luke 141. The result was not speaking in tongues, but speaking boldly the word of God. Jesus Christ himself was filled with the Holy Spirit in Luke 4 verse 1. Verse 18 was prophesied by Isaiah that the Spirit of God will be upon him. Look, let's look at Isaiah chapter 4 verse 18. As Jesus himself read his own word, and his prophecy. In Isaiah 4 18, I'm sorry, in Luke 4 18, quoting from Isaiah, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. You see the work of the Holy Spirit there? To preach. Not to speak in tongues, but to preach to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recover of sight to the blind to see to set free those who are downtrodden to proclaim the favorable year of the lord that is the fruit that is the ministry of the holy spirit in the lost life he was filled with the holy spirit and the outcome was all this Number the third aspect is feeling of the Holy Spirit occurred in post Pentecost era with no evidence of speaking in tongues. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 4, verse 8. Acts 4 8. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 4 8. Remember, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 4. There he spoke in tongues. But later, after the church began, in Acts 4, 8, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people. He, having been filled with the Holy Spirit, he could speak boldly to those who are trying to do them harm. He was, not, he was not afraid to talk to them because of the power of the Holy Spirit. The Jerusalem church was filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 4.31, they were threatened, they were told, never ever in your life mention the name Jesus again. And we're going to let you go but close your church. Close your ministry. Don't talk anything about Jesus anymore. Well, when they were told, the Bible tells us in, in verse, look at verse, look at verse, uh, Acts 4.23, and when they had been 
released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. Which means don't speak about Christ anymore. Well, what did they do? They went into prayer. Verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. That was the result of filling of the Holy Spirit. They all left, began to speak with boldness. Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 9.17. All these passages that we saw the function of the Holy Spirit, that none of them ever spoke in tongues. Having examined the passages where the feeling of the Holy Spirit occurred, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament times, pre-Pentecost and post-Pentecost, it is apparent that speaking in tongues is not the feeling of the Holy Spirit. That is taking it and making it what is not. And that's distortion. That is distortion. That is taking, making the primacy of the Holy Spirit and try to make it something else. And that's distraction. So that people will focus on that and leave the real purpose of the Holy Spirit coming into your life. In, in page 5, you can see the diagram, and that diagram actually is taken from my, the new book that is in progress on the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. You can see the soul. I don't need to draw it. You can see the soul. You can see the cycle. You see the chair, mind, intellect, and the will. If you cycle those mind, intellect, and will, that's what you call what I call it command post. That's you. That's the real you. Your mind, your intellect, and your will is the real you. And that's the command post that what comprises you your mind and that's why it is the your, your all actions are processed in the mind all actions are processed in the mind under the mentorship of your intellect carried out by the will carried out by the will your will is what carries out the action which you have already prepared in your mind. And that's why your mind is the battleground. Your mind is the battleground. Your mind, there are two powers struggling to capture your mind. The power of the Holy Spirit and the power of sin nature. If they get hold of your mind, they can turn, if you are a caterpillar and the Holy Spirit gets hold of you, he turns you into a butterfly. And if you are a butterfly, the old sin nature gets hold of you, he brings you back to caterpillar. So we have entrance, and look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Galatians 5. Galatians chapter 5, Paul tells us about these two powers. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17, but I say walk. It is in, in the Greek, it's in the present, it's an imperative mood in the present tense. That means keep on walking. Keep on. Don't just walk and stop. Keep going. Keep walking by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the, the, the desires of the flesh. For the flesh says its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. In other words, there are two opposing, opposing forces wanting to capture that headquarters. Old sin nature gets in, 
the, the Holy Spirit comes, comes out and you are totally filled with sin nature and from there on everything evil everything goes even including what my brother just taught us in a while ago the bitterness I, the only bitterness can be produced when the sin nature takes the command post of our soul then, number three in this outline the goal of the feeling of the Holy Spirit what is the goal we hear the feeling of the Holy Spirit both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. What is the goal? What is the objective? There must be a goal that God wants to accomplish in you. There must be a goal that God is trying to produce. There are four major objectives of the feeling of the Holy Spirit. Four major objectives. Number one, to produce the life of Christ in the child of God. To produce the life of Christ in the child of God. You have, take for instance, you just you have a an automobile, perhaps brand new or old automobile. What when you have an automobile, you have an engine, you have a, a transmission, <coughs> carburetor. I'm not a mechanic, but I, I have a little idea about all these things. And you have all these things set. You have the tires, brand new tires, or old tires, doesn't matter. Everything is ready to go. But you're not going anywhere until you have the fuel, the combustion fuel that takes all these things into motion, that converts all these the the your calibrated your transmission everything so we are we are ready we have got our md mdd all these things we have studied all these things and are so highly of power we got the determination we are ready we are good to go but you're not going anywhere until the combustion power takes over that's the holy spirit and that's why jesus said ah, ah, i see how excited you are you want to carry this message forward, but don't track, don't go anywhere until you receive this combustion power. Because it's going to drive your life. It's going to take you to places. It's going to do the unthinkable through your life. It's going to change you completely and produce what God wanted to be produced in perfection. And of course, when we understand all these things, see, most of us, we, 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 we lift our shoulders because we think we're doing something. No. That's what Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. What can you do? If you, you see, people are so prideful because they don't know the source of their production. If you know that it is the Holy Spirit that is working through you, producing all these magnificent results that people are saying, bravo, bravo. If you know it's the Holy Spirit, the more people say bravo, the more you sink because you know who is doing it. The more you diminish. You don't even you tell, you tell them if you know who is doing this, you wouldn't be saying bravo to Moses. You'd be saying bravo. The power of the Holy Spirit is amazing. If you know that, there's no room for pride. There's no room for competition. Because it does all the work. That's grace. So the Holy Spirit, He indwells us. You see, don't misconstrue don't dwelling with feeling. Two different things. He indwells you permanently. He fills you temporarily. We're going to come to the to the to the to, to the rest in a few in a few minutes. Two to produce divine fruit. We we'll come to that later. Galatians five twenty two through twenty three. To produce divine fruit. Three to empower and energize a believer to fulfill God's plan. The empowerment is not outward 
or physical manifestation, but rather in war. Invisible surpassing power that can turn a coward into a fearless instrument. Example, <coughs> Peter. In Matthew 26, 69 through 74, Peter categorically denied Jesus Christ. Then when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he became a different person. In Acts 2, 23, he spoke boldly to those who were instrumental in killing Christ. He made, the Holy Spirit made Peter, took ordinary man and made him extraordinary. Finally, the number four is to glorify Jesus Christ. To glorify Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit, we talk about Jesus Christ as being humble. The Holy Spirit is also humble. Humility in, in the Holy Spirit was shown because when you read the Bible, the Holy Spirit never made himself the focal point. Jesus said when he comes, he will glorify me. Uh, coming to a very important point, every one of them is important. Number four, types of the feeling of the Holy Spirit. There are two types, from my study and examination, two types of the feeling of the Holy Spirit. One, a unconditional feeling. You may, may, this may be your first time of hearing that. Unconditional feeling. No experiment, no, exp, no experiential. This is not experiential. Unconditional feeling. God in his infinite wisdom supernaturally empowers an individual in a special way for a special task. It does not require the individual's participation or obedience. God sovereignly fills him to accomplish a specific purpose. You say, Moses, I never heard that before. Because perhaps you haven't checked the scripture carefully. First of all, how, do, how can we, we, we made a statement, maybe you haven't heard for the first time, I said unconditional feeling. That means God fills a particular person for a particular reason, not because he's good. Not because he's of his obedience. We are, I have already given you an example of John the Baptist. He was filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. What has he done? Change his life? Become a good student? Become obedient to the plan of God? No, God just filled him for a particular reason. Not for his spiritual life. But to empower him to do a particular task. Look at 1 Samuel 19. 1 Samuel chapter 19. This were a bunch, bunch of bunch of knuckleheads, if you would, <laughs> who came to to give David headache. Sent by Saul. Verse 20. Then Saul sent messengers to take David, but when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying with Samuel standing and presiding over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. They prophesied. When, the, when you, hear, when you see the, the, the phrase came upon, it's synonymous to fear. This, the phrase come upon in the Old Testament is synonymous to filled with the Holy Spirit. Whatever Saul himself, we know the condition of Saul, that Saul was anything but obedient and good. But look at verse 23. And he proceeded there to Neph in Ramah, and the Spirit of God came upon him also. So that he went also prophesying continually until he came to Naoth in Ram. And he also stripped off his clothes. And he too prophesied before Samuel and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Well, that's not how I want to prophesy. <laughs> but he did. 
That was by the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit filled a carnal believer. A believer who was full of anger, full of hatred, full of bitterness that my brother thought so well this morning. But here is him being filled with the Holy Spirit. This is an unconditional feeling. God just wants something done. It doesn't matter how you look like or who you are or what you think. He just wants something done. If he wants to make you a fool, he can do that as he did with Saul. But to do that, the Holy Spirit will do that job. And so was, Saul was filled with the Holy Spirit. Basically, there was nothing good. We, find, we didn't find anything. <coughs> we saw it in Exodus 31, 1, 2, 3. The 70 elders were filled with the Holy Spirit. Numbers 11, 25. Gideon was filled with the Holy Spirit. Judges 6, 34. Samson of of every person, you will know the life of Samson. He was a womanizer, just to say the least. And yet, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. That means this has no connotation to life. This special feeling has no connotation to who and what you do. God wants something done, and that's it. But it's not it has nothing to do with your spiritual life. We'll come to that in a minute. John the Baptist, as we already seen, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. The church at large was filled with the Holy Spirit because God wants something done. This special feeling occurred both in the Old and the New Testament. God feels selected few for a special task. In light of the truth, one wonders the source of great accomplishment of the great awakening of the 19th century. D.L. Moody, Jonathan Edward, George Whitfield, and Charles Paul Jones. These people, God wanted to do something unique in this particular century. And he grabbed these few men and gave them, filled them with a special feeling. The same, they were not autistic like Bezalia, but in a different way. Charles Spurgeon was called the Prince of Preachers. No one has been able to duplicate his preaching the same way no one would have been able to duplicate the artistic work of Bezalia. This was done by the Holy Spirit in a special way. How I yearn that God will consider our own generation and pick up one or two people and do the same thing that he did with Charles Spurgeon, D.L. Moody, or any of these great men we hear about. God simply picked them up, not because they were better than others, and just filled them in this special way. Then we have the second one, the conditional B, the conditional feeling. This is where we come in. This is experiential. Has to do with obedience. With that, uh, the late Charles Ryrie and other great scholars, they all concentrate on obedience as a result of this experiential feeling. It requires believers' action. It is experiential, it is sanctification. There are three references to the feeling of the Holy Spirit in the Epistles, First Thessalonians 5:19, Ephesians 4 verse 30, and Galatians 5:16. All these things, when you read these passages, they all are talking in terms of the feeling or quenching or grieving. Do not quench, do not grieve the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That is telling you that there is something you can do in reference to this feeling and you hamper the work. They are foundational to understanding the condition of the feeling of the Holy Spirit. Obedience to God's word ensures feeling. Sin interferes with the feeling of the Holy Spirit. Conditional feeling. This special, this, this another type of feeling is conditional. 
and this is where we come in. Confession of sin restores the feeling of the Holy Spirit. Abraham Cooper, in the work 100 years ago, the work of the Holy Spirit, stated it beautifully. Sanctification is God's work in us, whereby he imparts to our members a holy disposition, inwardly filling us with delight in his law and with repugnance to sin. No wonder why the Apostle John tells us in 1 John 3 that when you are under the influence of the Holy Spirit, you cannot sin. A Christian with a yielded life is one who is serious about knowing and doing God's will. In other words, to experience the feeling of the Holy Spirit, we must yield, we must be obedient to the word of God. We must be obedient to the word of Christ. We must know the, what the will is and yield to it. We must be willing at all times to acknowledge our sins when we come short. But what a, a person, a picture number five, a picture of a life without the feeling of the Holy Spirit. A picture of the life of a life without the feeling of the Holy Spirit. Illustration of the fruit of the old sin nature. As it is outlined in Galatians 5, 19 through 20. We're talking about believers. Look at on page 7 of our outline. That's a picture of life turned upside down by constant disobedience to yield in obedience to the feeling of the Holy Spirit. If there is no neutral ground. It's this or that. Either you are filled with the Holy Spirit or you are filled with the sin nature. What our brother uh, Roxa talked before, the only, the only way you can manif manifest bitterness is when you are controlled by the sin nature. When the sin nature takes the command post of your soul, it will produce the fruit of sin nature which Paul outlined, not just bitterness, anger, hatred, jealousy, envy, just list them. They will be present in your soul as a believer. And you keep going around in anger, in bitterness, in hatred, no happiness, no joy. Every time somebody looks, to, looks, looks at you, tell the person, Jesus saves, he says, well, you need to be saved yourself. You look at the person, there's no joy, no peace in you. The reason is that the old sin nature has taken occupancy of your soul and you are filled with it and it's producing his fruit. But what's the opposite? In the last page, illustration of the feeling of the Holy Spirit. You say when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit takes occupancy of your soul, this is your soul, and this is that command post of the soul where you have your mind, you have the intellect, and the will. That's the command post of your soul. And so it, it is when the Holy Spirit, remember, is not a force, he's not a, he's not a wind, he's not just air that comes in and fills a room. He's a person. When he enters into your soul, even though invisible, but a person. He armed with divine assets. All the assets that God has, divine. The Holy Spirit comes in, when he comes into your soul, nothing else, the sin nature is not there. The whole, the total occupancy, that's what you call fear. He has taken total occupancy of your soul, <coughs> particularly the command post of your soul, your mind. Remember what I said about the, the influence. When the Holy Spirit influences you, when he influences your mind, it affects your thought. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4 verse 8, is there anything is of worthy of thought? Well, it is the Holy Spirit producing that divine thought. 
that divine talk now moves you into action. That action is also divine. Hey, from now, from this point, whereby the Holy Spirit has influenced you, from this moment on to the end, everything will be divine. There will be nothing like competition. There will be nothing like self-promotion. There will be nothing like trying to show us that you are better. Because now the Holy Spirit is producing everything you need to be like Christ. Your action is purely divine. When people see you, they know that that's the life of Christ. Your habit, that becomes a habit. Eventually it becomes your lifestyle. And character is developed. Spiritual integrity. Character is developed. And so when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit fills you, means he enters and occupies you. This is the conditional, not unconditional. This one depends on you. It depends on how you conduct yourself and obey the word of God. But see, quickly see the result. According to Galatians 5.22, it says that the 22-23, that the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. But those, each of these that the Holy Spirit has produced in you has a target to handle with. Your enemy, you cannot deal with your enemy on your own. I'm going to be, today, I'm going to be nice to him. That's a joke. Somebody who wants you dead. How can you be nice to him? When the Holy Spirit fills you, he produces the divine law. It's no longer your law. It takes control. It takes control of your mind, which influences your thought. Now you are loving your enemy as if he's your closest friend. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is joy, which takes care of your suffering. You are under suffering, tremendous suffering, but the Holy Spirit overpowers you that your suffering doesn't even look like a suffering anymore. That's why Paul can say in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 4, we rejoice greatly, abundantly in our suffering. And he told the Philippians, I say to you, rejoice. Again, rejoice. How can you say that? Only through the Holy Spirit. Can you rejoice when things are falling apart in your life? Peace. This isn't just peace. This is the peace that belongs to God. The very peace that God has. Thank God for that. It doesn't depend on circumstances. Otherwise, God would have looked down on our political arena now and he said, I lost my peace. <laughs> But God, his peace is undiminished, unchangeable, constant, because circumstances do not control it. It does not swing like a pendulum, this way, that way, it's constant. God gives you the same peace, whereby you are, things fall apart in your life, you don't even know, because you are held by the peace of the Holy Spirit. Patience. By nature, we are people of drive-through. Drive-through, that's our, that's our drive-through, now or never. You don't, you don't want to go into the restaurant and sit down for wait for one hour. You want drive-through. What do you need there? Hold the pickle. <coughs> By the time you put pickle and ketchup, that's, that takes too long. Just the burger and the bun, and the bun that's enough. Plain, because <coughs> you are in a hurry. <coughs> Patience takes care of anxiousness. Kindness, you become unkind, deals with unkind people. Goodness, you are able to treat undeserving people as Christ would. Faithfulness in all things, not just few things, but in all things. Gentleness, dealing with others in a gentle manner. Self-control, not just in few things, but in everything. This is not you. This is the Holy Spirit in charge. That's what we call feeling of the Holy Spirit. And that's the life that God desired of each and every one of his children. 
That is the life he desires of the church, the present church. And that is the life that is lacking in today's church. It is my prayer and heart desire that the church will return to its root. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for your love and for your mercy. Knowing that you have a plan undiminished. A plan that no man can thwart. Our Jesus confirmed. Our Jesus Christ, our Jesus, our Savior Jesus Christ confirmed. I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not hamper with it. Thank God for years, for centuries, your church has never disappeared. We've got down several times, but every now and then, you have lifted it up because of your faithfulness. And it is my prayer that you take this truth and seal it on the tablets of our souls and cause, it, cause us to remember that you have a greater plan, bigger than our needs, bigger than our own agenda, to glorify you. So cause us to focus and cause our hearts to yearn for the fulfillment of your plan. We lift our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.